Hi, and welcome to the latest reflection in our Bible in One Year series. This covers days 111 to 117, which I admit some of you will have covered donkeys ago. Some of you maybe more recently. Some of you might not have got there yet. Some of you might not have started, but you're all still welcome to come and connect with this. And I pray that God will use it to speak to each of us. This covers the, uh, the end of Luke's Gospel and the early chapters of Joshua. The early part of the Old Testament can be pretty hard going sometimes, can't it? With all the very specific, detailed laws in Leviticus and the long lists that make up a huge chunk of numbers. Well, I'm afraid this next section of the Old Testament can be heavy going for a quite different reason. It's rather violent and there's not a lot of getting away from that. And it's hard to equate the somewhat tribal God we encounter in, say, Joshua, with the New Testament vision of a God whose love extends to all creation. And never mind the New Testament, it's hard to match it with the God who blessed Abraham so that he would be a blessing to the whole world. But we must always try to read and understand these sections in the light of what God has revealed to us in Jesus. The Bible isn't God's ultimate revelation to us. Jesus is. However, even in this quite tribal and bloody and perhaps barbaric part of the Bible, the early part of Joshua contains a few hints that God's vision extends more widely than we might imagine on first reading. In Joshua 5, which is, say day 114, Joshua is approaching Jericho when he encounters a man who's standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hands. And there are others who in the Old Testament see some of the have some of these mysterious divine encounters and it's all very ambiguous but there are some who think it's an angel and there are some who think that these people are encountering the second person of the Trinity that is Jesus before he comes to earth. Whatever the case Joshua approaches the stranger and asks are you for us or for our enemies? And rather cryptically, the other figure replies, neither. But as the commander of the Lord's armies, I have come. Then as Joshua falls on his face in worship, the figure continues, take off your sandals because the place you're standing on is holy. It's an interesting thing. God wants or Joshua wants to know if God's on his side or theirs. And he's told, oh, for goodness sake, Joshua, could you get a bigger perspective? The other hint that God's vision extends more widely is the inclusion of another character in the early part of Joshua. Her name is Rahab. In some translations of the Bible, she's described as an innkeeper, though the Hebrew more literally translates as prostitute. Joshua sends two spies into Jericho to check out the city and they end up in the house of a prostitute. Make of that what you will. Word reaches the king of Jericho that there are spies at her house and they're at Rahab's house. But Rahab hides them and when the guards come to her house she says, Yeah, yeah, they came here but I didn't know where they were from. And Well, I think they left the city before it got shut up for the night. And Rahab then tells the spies that she knows God is going to give them the city and that she has heard of all that God has done for this people and that their God is, or their Lord is God of heaven above and the earth below. And she asks that when they do take this city, that she and her family are spared. And that is what happened. And... She plays no further part in the Joshua story. 
she disappears as quickly as she appears. Not unlike Mary Magdalene, actually, in our New Testament accounts in the Gospels. But we do hear of her in a few places in the New Testament. James uses her, uses her as an example of faith in action. In Hebrews 11, that long account of the heroes of faith, Rahab is one of only two women mentioned. Sarah is the other one. And although the fall of Jericho was mentioned, she is the only individual from the entirety of the book of Joshua to make the list. Joshua does get a mention elsewhere in Hebrews, but in Hebrews 11, he does not get a mention, but Rahab does. But the other one, that's the real mind blower. For Rahab is one of four women in the genealogy of Jesus. Rahab, it appears, goes on to marry a man called Salmon, and they have a son. His name is Boaz. And he'll pop up again soonish when we encounter the story of Ruth. And their son becomes the grandfather of King David. And eventually, through David's line, we eventually come to Jesus. So think about that. One of the most, if not the most important figure in the Old Testament, and certainly the most important figure in the New Testament, in fact, the most important person in the history, in part, owe their existence, not to some kind of priestly class, not to some kind of insider, not to some kind of prophet, not even to one of the chosen people as such, but to Rahab, a prostitute from Jericho. God has room for all sorts of people. And we find evidence of that again in Luke's account of the crucifixion on day 115 and 116. Luke is the champion of the outsider throughout. But here again, we get a couple of examples. The people stand on watching, the rulers sneer at him, the soldiers tell him to show he's a king by saving himself. Even one of those dying with him is taunting him. But one looks across and sees in Jesus hope. The only hope he has left. And like Rahab, as much out of desperation as anything else, he looks at Jesus and says, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says, Today you'll be with me in paradise. And this, then there's a centurion who looks on and watches him die and says, Surely he was a righteous man. All those people who could have got it. But those were the two that did. Never lose sight of whom God can reach and never dismiss yourself or anyone else as useless in God's plans. And certainly never try to co-opt God for your side when what you really need is a bigger vision. God has room for all sorts. He always has. And he's not in the business of changing now. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you that even in the midst of some of the toughest, most violent bits of the Bible, we catch tiny little glimpses of grace and an assurance of the breadth of your love and purposes. Help us to trust in you, to grasp that bigger vision and to know that you can use even us to do more than we can possibly expect. Amen. Grace and peace be with you.